All right, hi there, everybody. I am Raj Bhattacharji. I'm here representing the Georgia Tech Research Institute. We do a one-minute uh, version of who we are and what we do. We're a research institute located in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we primarily work with uh, partners in the Department of Defense, uh, state and local governments as well, as well as some private industry to do uh, research. Uh, specifically, we do a lot of RF, electromagnetics, electronic warfare, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, today's talk is called Radio ML Redux, GTRI efforts on the Army Signal Classification Challenge. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, what, are we, what are we gonna do? I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of uh, what, what we're talking about here. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the GTRI approach to the Signal Classification Challenge. Uh, then we're gonna dive into some of this math and some of our new uh, approaches we took to the Signal Classification Challenge and then the results and final thoughts. Okay, so let's talk about uh, something that happened two years ago. Uh, I came here to the GNU RadioCon in uh, Boulder, and we talked about devices like this. These are reconfigurable little SDR dongles with a computer behind them and a commercial battery pack. And I argued that this, uh, such systems are gonna cause an unpre unprecedented degree of software reconfigurability. This is something we all know and understand. And uh, in this setting, the protocol's reconfigurable, the modulations are reconfigurable, the frequencies, the data rates, the encoding, you name it. So then the question arises, uh, if, if we studied all this stuff for low power embedded platforms, what do we do about it when everyone in the world is using something like this? And this is kind of the driving question behind what the RCO uh, office, uh, the Rapid Capabilities Office talked about this morning and the MITRE folks talked about uh, earlier, is uh, how do we begin to get a handle on what's going on in the RF spectrum when everything is software defined and software reconfigurable. And so um, the answer many of us in this room believe is machine learning for all this reconfigurable stuff. So you, know, you can learn the algorithms from your specific, uh, for your specific problem, you can train in the lab and perform in the real world using accelerator of your choice. So this is, this is what anybody who's played around with this stuff has done so far. Um, and I just wanted to mention there's a lot of concern that perhaps deep learning, machine learning, these are hype terms. It's not really hype when you dig down into it. It's just a bunch of linear algebra, matrix multiplies, some weak nonlinearities, and optimizers. So it's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, solve, it's an algorithm by optimization. You let the optimizer discover the algorithm given some structure. And it's data driven and requires good data sets. So that's kind of why this talk is called uh, Radio ML Redux. So uh, several years ago now, uh, Tim O'Shea, when he was at Virginia Tech, released this Radio ML data set. And uh, it's got open source data generation code. Uh, the license is very permissive. It's kind of part of the, let's call it the GNU Radio EU. You know, came out of this community and the people who are here. And it's a whole bunch of labeled IQ samples. Uh, I think there's, uh, I'll get into the details and they're synthetically created using GNU Radio and pushed through channel models and some other impairments. And for anybody who was around back then, I don't know why, I always think of the Doge when I think of Tim. It's probably <laughs> something on Twitter. Um. All right, on the other hand, the Army Signal Classification Challenge folks uh, released this data set. They call it, I call it the AC, ASCC data set, Army Signal Classification Challenge. Uh, you have to use it under terms of an agreement, and that was kind of the root of my question earlier is uh, how do we get our hands on it? So the fact is if you have already signed this agreement and you've downloaded the data, you're good to go. You can actually play around with this data set. It is also a bunch of labeled IQ samples. It apparently has been drawn from a larger repository of data. And this morning we found out that these were synthetically created with channel impairments as well. That's what was released. So let's look at some similarities and some differences. Um, ASCC has 24 classes that are listed here. The RadioML uh, .10a data set uh, has 11 classes that are listed here. Things that are in bold are actually common across. So it's almost as if the ASCC is a proper superset, uh, almost. PAM4 is, does not appear in ASCC. Uh, what are some other similarities and differences? Well, the training examples in ASCC are 1024 by two matrices. That's 1024 time samples, and then I and Q. Uh, it's in Python pickle files, and the signals come at various levels of AWGN added in. Uh, 
the similarities uh, with RadioML are similar. It's Python pickle files at various SNRs. And I believe the 2010A data set has this same 1024 by 2 uh, data structure for your training examples. Um, also, pass through channel models. And this channel unknown for the ASCC is because this morning, uh, this slide was not updated for what we heard from RCO this morning. And for size comparisons, the RadioML data set is about 600 megs of raw data. And ASCC was like 30 plus. It's like 35 gigs of unpacked pickle files. So uh, I have this empty conclusion slide here. Uh, after what we heard this morning, it seems like if you want to get into machine learning using uh, data-driven approaches where you take the data and derive your algorithms from that data using optimizers, that um, you know, RadioML is going to be what's available. And it sounded like there's going to be some new uh, data sets coming out as well uh, very soon uh, with some improvements, I gather. <coughs> OK, so let's get into what we did there. Now that we've kind of set the stage, tied in the ASCC to the GNU Radio community, what did GTRI do? So we used kind of the good old con uh, convolutional neural nets. We still were trying to take the benefits from the image processing community and, and uh, realize them for signal processing. We used a machine learning stack uh, consisting of the following software. It's a Keras for the high level uh, neural net stuff. Uh, TensorFlow for kind of the low-level stuff, uh, CUDA and the GPU for acceleration. And every time we made our algorithms, we kind of prototyped on RadioML first, actually, before we did real runs on this 35-gig data set. Generally, we used a 10%, uh, I'm sorry, 90%, 10% uh, test training split. And our team was organized in several parallel efforts. We had some things that I call new ideas for RF signals, uh, machine learning. We had some hand-tuned network design where a bunch of people tweaked and played around with and iteratively came up with uh, network architectures. And then we had some people look at using evolutionary algorithms for automatic search. If you want to talk about anything that's not the new ideas for RF signals for machine learning, uh, please find me after the talk, and we can talk about those. The, today's topic is going to be new ideas for RF signals machine learning, uh, specifically in continents. So uh, convoluted neural net, I'm sorry, convolutional neural networks um, for complex real-valued signals are one of the new ideas we had. Um, so the question is, we have this thing that's IQ data, and it's inherently, we think of it as complex. We think of it as having a two-dimensional structure. So how do you take this two-dimensional structure and um, do neural nets, respecting the complex nature of the data? And this is something that uh, Miter earlier this morning mentioned as well. And of course, uh, I want to freely, uh, I want to mention that I'm going to freely say convolution or correlation, because when you're learning the, the filter taps, when you're learning these weights, it doesn't really matter how you order your variables. So if I say convolution when I mean correlation, I mean the same operation. And we'll get to what that is. Um, so we use convolution neural nets. That's not very much of a new idea. But, but respecting the complex nature and using it in a real valued package, that's new. Uh, we came up with a new activation function. I call it the co-relu, so we'll get into what that is. Uh, we got into complex max pooling. Once you see how the co-relu works, you'll understand how complex max pooling works as well. And then we also did <clears throat> something I call learned linear transformations. So uh, we're going to focus on the uh, real-valued co-relu stuff right now. So as backup, talk about how convolutional neural nets uh, classically have worked. Um, for images, it's a whole bunch of little feature detectors, which you see up here, which are little edge detectors. Then you create collections of those edges, and you get some things that look like squiggles. Then you look at collections of collections of edges, and you start to see stuff like eyebrows and, and outlines of eyes, and et cetera. And then eventually, you may have whole faces in this chain here. So this is from some early work in this area. Um, so what, what a, a convolutional neural net does is hierarchically look for higher and higher order features. Um, at the lowest level, it's these edge detectors. And at the highest level, it's like a high level feature. And then you train a feature classifier that goes from feature space to your, your label space for a classification problem. So this is how you train these things. Let's say you have a whole bunch of labeled data. You have examples that I've called Z1, Z2 to Zn. Each one has a label. Then f of f, the function f, is the neural net. That's the mapping that takes in some IQ samples as input and creates some output. And then here are some key points. f of z has to be differentiable. Uh, or you can make it be differentiable under some certain conditions. It often has millions of free parameters. 
And then learning is just getting these equations to be true. So when I give it a training example, learning is just a, a gradient-based weight update procedure to find out what are the parameters, what are these 10 million parameters I need to make the problem be solved. So to do this in complex space, we need to back up perhaps a little bit and look at real-valued functions. So here's a real-valued um, feature detector. You correlate against some feature in a time domain signal. Maybe you take the absolute value of it. Then you look at some threshold, like if the correlation is larger than some threshold, I say I have a successful detection. What does this look like in the time domain for a real signal? In the left plot here, I have a chirp. In the center plot here, I have a feature in that chirp I'm looking for. In this case, it's some specific frequency. When I correlate, I slide my feature across the input, and I get some peaks here. That's my correlator output. And what that indicates is at that time, that feature happened. In this case, it's this frequency represented by this rate of wiggle happened around time here. So then we go through this absolute value piece, and we find a bunch of peaks. And then you can say at these times corresponding to this range, four to six seconds perhaps, uh, we had a correlation. This is all real valued, and this is stuff that we know from signal processing. So the question arises, how do we naturally extend this to complex data? And this is how we do it. With the real valued package, um, say you have some sequence in, uh, in this standard format where we have I in one column and Q in another, samples of Q in another. And the core operation of a convolutional neural net is to convolve or correlate against a bunch of filter taps. Call them H1 uh, through HM with a single prime for the real part and a double prime for the imaginary part. And so if we correlate these naively, uh, we come up with a three column result. So we all kind of remember how correlation works, right? You take these two things in two columns, you overlap, multiply, add, you're gonna get one result. You overlap, multiply, add here, and then you overlap, multiply, add here. So you get a three column result. And what's interesting is that like this part where you took the real part correlated with the uh, imaginary part of the taps, and then the imaginary part of your signal uh, correlated with the real part of your taps, that actually appears in the correct uh, complex correlation. But what are these two other terms? Well, they, they should look familiar. They're the other piece. So if you go through and properly look at the correlation uh, of two complex sequences, what you get is the real part of the answer is the difference between those two terms that are in the first and third columns of the naive result. And then the middle column on the left side is actually correct. The middle column of the left side is the imaginary part of the answer you're supposed to get. So this is all to say that um, it's possible to do complex valued correlations respecting complexity just by doing it naively using TensorFlow and then taking a, a matrix product where you just add the first and third columns together. Okay, so what does complex valued correlation mean? What does it look like? So I have an example of uh, the autocorrelation of some long sequence here in this plot. And what you see is that uh, you've got I and Q, and I've plotted a trajectory in the IQ space. So this is in your, your uh, QAM diagram space, but for much shorter time scales. Um, so notice that you've got a bunch of garbage in this middle here, but then you get a nice big peak. And then if you phase rotate, say, your filter taps by all the same amount, all it does is it phase rotates this whole picture. So if I want to generalize the real case, it's pretty obvious to see that all I care about is the fact that this is very large and this is very small. It doesn't matter what the rotation is. And in fact, the phase rotation may be important further down the line. And so the new activation function we looked at was this co-relu. Uh, we derived it uh, using this equation here, where essentially you relu on just the magnitude of the signal and you pass through the phase. So what this does is if you can see on the bottom plot there, I've got the original stuff that I showed you. And in the top plot, we have what happens after you go through co-relu. So it takes all this gunk in the middle that you don't care about and it shrinks it down to zero. And so what has happened is that we've, we've made a correlation with a complex sequence. The real IQ sequence, this is a, a new activation function that has the mathematics of, you know, of how IQ correlation works baked into it. And as far as we know, this is a, a pretty novel result. So what are some of the other new ideas we looked at? Uh, learned linear transformations. So what are, what are those? There's often this question that arises like, okay, what do we feed into our classification algorithms? 
Do we feed in the FFT? Do we feed in some spectrogram? Do we feed in some wavelet? What's the best choice? And what I want to point out is that something like the FFT is a linear transformation, and it's given by this matrix. And what you do is you take the signal that came in, you multiply it times this matrix up here, and you end up with the FFT of your, your data sequence, uh, the DFT in this case. Um, if you implement this W smart, then we call that the FFT. But the point is, this is a matrix multiply, and so you can start to generalize and say, what's the best matrix to stick right here? Is it the frequency domain representation? Is it something else? And so why not learn this matrix? That's what we call the learn linear transformation. Is you stick a block up front that basically, this is just a Keras uh, example with a lot of stuff missing, but essentially you, you make a new Keras layer that uh, is the learned linear transformation, and it has some uh, weight matrix, and you tell Keras that those weights are updatable, and you make it all linear. So essentially now your, uh, your convolutional network has been augmented with a linear transformation up front to go do something like a frequency domain transform first. It comes up with a transform that's very useful for the task at hand. And then you go through all your convolutions and your, your um, regression SVM type classifier at the end. So uh, we tried some different initial conditions for the optimizer runs. So you've got this matrix. You can initialize it to the, the DFT matrix. You can initialize it to something else. You can initialize it randomly. You can initialize it to the identity matrix. So in that case, you have a linear transform that just passes through the data, input to output, and then you start updating the weights in this linear piece of the transform that lives up front. And then it's basically gonna start with the time domain IQ representation, and it's gonna learn and morph into something else. If you initialize it to the DFT matrix, it'll start with the frequency domain representation and then land somewhere else once it's done training. Okay, so we put all that together, and uh, you may have seen the list before uh, that RCO presented or MITRE presented. Number 15 was Team Yellow Jackets, that was us. So we put a lot of these ideas into it and uh, we came in uh, 15th out of 49. I'm not gonna present any of the, the confusion matrices and metrics because this talk is really about ideas and trying to uh, inspire some of you guys to go try this stuff out with uh, learned linear transformations, new uh, uh, functions for, uh, new activation functions for doing this kind of problem. And truth be told, most of our submissions that were successful were actually using the hand-tuned networks. This was because the hand-tuned team, uh, one, they had much better hardware, were able to train faster, and then the other piece is the hand-tuned team at Georgia Tech is a, a husband and wife couple, so they were able to go home and keep hacking when the rest of us had lives. It's kind of not fair. So uh, it's my intention to try to take some of this stuff and, and get it out to the community though, uh, and maybe publish a, a paper at some point when I have time to write it all up for what we actually were able to achieve with just this. So I'd like to eventually get to an apples to apples comparison of, okay, this is without co u and learn linear transformations, and this is with, and look at the improvement. And I can tell you that there is some improvement in uh, classification performance, at least on radio ML. So here's some final notes. Um, yeah, so uh, one, of my, one of my gripes about the, the challenge was that log loss is a very strange scoring metric. It's really good for optimizing in machine learning, but it's not the greatest for determining who did better. Um, and then here's another quirk that I think we noticed. Human speech has lots and lots of silence in it. So when you have some analog audio modulation like FM, narrowband, FM, wideband, you can have trouble if you're using human speech as the input. Um, in that a lot of sections will sound like just a carrier wave, unmodulated, because somebody paused or took a breath in the middle, and there's not a whole lot of audio to drive that FM modulator. So these are some little quirks that maybe uh, could be worked out as uh, some final notes on the challenge. Um, and my overall final thoughts before I wrap up and take some questions is that uh, doing ML for signals and radio is super fun, and if a lot of times you show up at this conference and you start hacking on GNU Radio. I think we should have breakout sessions at some point in the future to go hack on machine learning stuff. Um, go download TensorFlow and Keras like today. Uh, you don't have to have a PhD in machine learning anymore to do machine learning. If you can, if you can GNU Radio, you can get these packages working. Um, if you can do GNU Radio on Windows, uh, I don't know. Um, 
You, you probably have already figured all this stuff out. Um, and then another take home point for me is that there's still low hanging fruit in this area of taking algorithms that were developed in the image and, and uh, speech processing communities and bringing them into RF. Uh, just by applying computer vision stuff, that's my time, uh, just by applying computer vision stuff, uh, you can still potentially make like world class results because there's not a whole lot that's been published out there. And with that, I will take your questions. Okay, we have two mics again. One is over there, and I'm here. So we have time for questions, so don't be shy. Raise your hands. Okay, we have one over there. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my first question is real easy. Is there, did you publish a paper on this I could go read? No. Um, it's forthcoming, but don't hold me to that. It's one of those things where you, know, you run out of time and money. And, yep. Yeah, so we intend on, at the least, I, I intend on writing up the basics of this co-relu as a new uh, activation function and the LLTs. Gotcha. And then uh, in the learned, the learned learning, the, the learned yeah. linear transforms, yeah. how sensitive was it to initial state? Did it, did it tend to go to different places with a different initial state? Yes, it finds totally different solutions. Yeah, um, because in the one case, when you start with, say, DFT matrix initialization, what it begins, what the con piece of it starts to learn is frequency domain features. So for example, we know that this specific QPSK with this 0.35 excess bandwidth um, filter has a roll-off shape that looks like this. And because it's iterative, once that piece starts locking in on that shape, then it's gonna you know, drive things towards frequency-esque transforms. Whereas if you start in the time domain, then the conv layers start learning, okay, I know a QPSK wiggle goes like this in the, in the IQ space. And so, yeah, it definitely is highly sensitive to your initial conditions. How far did you explore? I mean, did, was there like a group of steady states that it eventually yielded to? Or was it effective if I made a bigger set of initial matrices, I just had a bigger set of final states? Um, or maybe you didn't explore that. Yeah, what's here, what's listed there is kind of the four initializations we looked at. Uh, the, the glow rot, which is known in the machine learning community, a uniform distribution, and then the identity, which is time, and then the DFT matrix, which is frequency. Um, some other ideas we had is, okay, the DFT matrix can actually be squashed. So DFT matrix is square, and it takes n time samples and maps them to n frequency samples, but why? I could have n time samples in and map that to n over two frequency buckets, in which case this matrix would be skinny, I guess. And so we looked at ideas like that as well. Um, just we're, you know, we're always on the hunt for ways to continue this work. So if somebody in this room wants to continue to collaborate in an informal capacity, um, I'm happy to keep exploring. Well, sorry, I'll end with this. When Please, you explored no. those additional, uh, the skinny matrices, did you find that it it resolved to previously found steady states or that it, well, I guess it couldn't because it's a skinny matrix now, but. Right, so what happens there is that, say you start with the DFT matrix and then you made it skinny, like by, by retweaking these formulas, I can make a skinny DFT that maps n, uh, frequent, uh, n time samples to m frequency buckets. Um, yeah, I can't say a whole lot about what we found. I mean, we played around with it, but you know, there's no hard results that I can tell you about right now. Thank you. Sure. Is the next speaker already mic'd up? Okay, excellent. So EJ. Hey, great talk. Um, so in, in, uh, in, in image processing, for example, it's common to have uh, you know, convolutional networks that have like, multiple channels uh, and you know, downstream layers. So I was wondering if you uh, th thought about, and maybe I just missed this in the talk, but um, I was wondering if you thought about perhaps doing these initializations on different channels of some, some kind of layer and then uh, putting additional downstream layers on top of that, um, and what kind of results you got from like combining these various approaches that you've c discovered here through uh, you know expert knowledge in in a more machine learning type way. Oh, I see. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at some kind of ensemble approach. Maybe just take several of these and is that yeah, what absolutely, you're at? absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, I we yeah we didn't do a whole lot, oh, but okay. I, I would love to. Cool. Cool. Yeah. We have like, you have a question? Brent? Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, I actually, I, um, 
I was just not entirely sure I understood the co-relu. So you, you are doing a relu on the amplitude? Correct, on only so the amplitude. Isn't the amplitude always positive? So what does a relu do on a positive number? So if you looked at the way I had the drawing, there's a co-relu on the absolute value plus the bias. So in most neural nets, you have oh, the, there's a bi okay. there's the bias. Yeah, so, right, so think right. of it this way. You have some picture in IQ space. You take everything and, and Everything that's inside of a circle gets mapped to the minimum value. Everything outside of the circle gets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's like you take a, a circle, shrink it down to the origin, and make everything inside the circle disappear. Did that's you, what it does. Did you do a liter, li little literature search? Because I, I thought I saw something similar to, to there that. There is sort of stuff that is similar. Right. This specifically for IQ data, as far as I know, has not been done. The general idea of using like exponential functions in the complex plane was looked at for like models of neurons, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. But nobody's dusted it off, and certainly nobody's added the bias. And the physical thing here is that this is what you would do. If I asked you to make a feature detector in, in NumPy or in MATLAB, you'd correlate, and then you'd take small correlations and you'd throw them away. So it's uh, reflecting the, what we know as human experts about uh, signal processing in the structure of the neural net. Cool. Okay, Thank we, you, yeah, looking forward to talking more offline. Definitely. So, so the next speaker can come up and set up. And we have maybe like a super short one. Is yours very short? Okay, you, you have like 30 seconds to answer his question. All right, so. I'll make it <laughs> Just a follow on to the previous question. The bias for the co-relu, is that its own learned bias or does it use the layer bias? It is learned. It's a learned parameter. So. Now you don't have to worry about what is the threshold that I'll call a detection. The network will find the best threshold to say, oh, if the IQ you know, uh, correlation is outside of this region, that's a detection. So it figures it out. That's what learned. Okay, so it's a separate bias from, well, typically a neural network has a weight matrix and a set of biases. It's the same thing. Okay. Weight matrix and set of, of biases is still the same. It's just the biases are introduced at a different place inside the activation function. All right. Thank okay. you very much, Raj. All right. Thank you.